Dr. Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, answer some questions we have regarding social networking and cyber security. And first we'd like to know about your experience with Vivo, which is one of the most popular social networkings in the UK and all over the world. So can you highlight on your experience and the challenges you face? Uh, well, uh, on a social networking site, um, the, traditionally what we understand are the risks online are that you may have predatory males, you may have bully, predatory males talking young, young girls and boys, you may have people bullying one another, um, there are concerns about inappropriate content, that young people create videos when they're bullying one another or slapping or hitting each other. So there are a plethora of issues that we have to combat and we take um, a three-pronged three approach. Number one is that I chair the European Commission's um, uh, social networking task force. Mm -hmm. uh, I work with the industry uh, to, uh, to develop a set of good practice safety guidelines. So we as industry develop them in mm -hmm. partnership with uh, support uh, with um, uh, child protection experts and law enforcement. And the idea is, we think about a social networking site as a location. We need to make sure that we have good practice recommendations about, for example, making sure that internet safety advice is easily accessible, that it's mm. prominent, that it doesn't just reside in the terms of service, mm. that uh, secondly, that it's easy to report uh, uh, instances of abuse. Mm. Um, so there are a range, there are seven principles, mm. and uh, industry worked for nine months to develop these principles, mm. and the European Commission uh, uh, held an event on February the 10th mm. of this year mm. to um, and invited industry to sign up to the implementation. Mm -hmm. So that has happened and we are now in the process of evaluating, assessing how well people have implemented mm -hmm. what uh, the safety features on their site. So mm -hmm. we develop the principles and then we encourage each company to mm -hmm. write about uh, how they've implemented those um, recommendations. Because we as industry recognize that perhaps sometimes we're not really good at telling people all of the good things that we do. Mm. And people assume that industry is not doing anything, that they're mm. not being responsible. So these self-declarations, if you Google mm -hmm. EU safer social networking principles, mm -hmm. you'll come to the EU, the European Commission's homepage. Mm -hmm. There you will see not only the document of the principles, but every company that signed up to those principles, their self-declaration, they declare how they've implemented those, mm -hmm. right? So that's mm -hmm. a really significant step forward mm -hmm. and it's something that I think could be replicated in non-EU countries. Mm -hmm. Secondly, then, we decided, well, you know what, let's just check and make sure that in a transparent way the people have implemented what they've outlined in their self-declarations. Mm -hmm. So that process is taking place now. Mm -hmm. um, with, there's a team of expert researchers that will, um, they've devised a methodology, we've consulted on that, and they will start uh, the assessment in about mid to end of October. Mm -hmm. So by Internet Safety Day, which falls every year in February, mm -hmm. uh, the commissioner, mm -hmm. and I think it may still be Vivian Red Redding, mm -hmm. will be able to announce the results of that assessment. Mm -hmm. So industry is doing a lot. So if you think of that, that's prong one, that's mm -hmm. the location. That's how you engage industry in developing good practices yeah. to secure the location. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we have very close relationships. We have to think about the offenders, those people who exploit our services, be it mm -hmm. for hacking, spam, predatory males, bullying, we need to think about um, making sure that young people can report easily. On Bebo, on every single page, on every single user's page is a report of use link. Mm. Except you're wrong because you're not likely to be reporting okay. yourself. But on every other user's page is a report of use link. So you can report to our abuse management team and they will respond. We've got clear policies, procedures and protocols about how we respond. Mm. So in the instance of somebody says somebody mean, something mean, or they post uh, an inappropriate video that they've mm. taken of you. You can um, send a, a click on the report of use. Our systems capture the information of the subject of the report and the person who is reporting. Mm. So it's very easy for our abuse management team to then just go to the pages and see what's happening and take an action. Mm. The actions can be a warning to mm. say, you, you know, it's come to our attention that your behavior is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And with the cease and desist, you know, do not do this again. If you do, your account will be deleted. Yeah. If the activity is a little bit more egregious, we'll delete the account. Mm -hmm. If it's very serious and it's potentially uh, illegal, then we'll report it to the police and work with them so that they can to facilitate the investigative process. They give us the right documents, um, requesting IP addresses, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of work that we do at law enforcement. And then one of the key things that I think is often neglected 
is understanding the criminal act. A criminal mm -hmm. act involves exploiting a young person, you know, yes. when, you know, in the instance of a social networking site. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why is this young person vulnerable? And being a forensic psychologist, I spend a lot of time profiling mm -hmm. at-risk young people. Yeah. And very often the profile of an at-risk young child is somebody who may have a, a, a mental health issue. Mm -hmm. It could be acute, it could be chronic. Or it could be very easily, a, a, you know, middle class, family, they're well functioning, but the child is going through some acute issue in school, maybe a bit of bullying, maybe they've been excluded. Mm -hmm. There's something that's bothering them and they need help and support. And, mm -hmm. and in the time that I was um, researching for my PhD, I spent time posing as an 8, 10 or 12 year old mm -hmm. online to see how I could understand the grooming practices. Mm -hmm. And typically these guys will say to you, oh, you're so lovely. Um, can you send me a picture? You mm. sound like a lovely person. And very quickly the conversation evolves into, you know, I feel like you're my soulmate. I love you. Tell me what's bothering you. I'll be there for you. So these young people are getting what they think is help and support and love. Mm. But of course this is a ploy by, by the individual. Mm. My thinking, what I was trying to communicate today is that the experts are giving mental health, social care, support and advice mm. our, our organizations that we have in the real world and I've been spending the last 18 months evangelizing to them saying you really should have your presence online. Mm. You should be accessible 24-7 to these young people. Yeah. And it's very difficult as a young person, if you've got an issue with your body image or you might be self-harming, yeah. you may not necessarily know the name of the organization that's going to help you. Mm. So what we've done on Bebo is create the Be Well platform and encourage all the support organizations to set up their presence within mm. Be Well. Yeah. So you as a user, when well, you're feeling unwell, mm. for whatever reason, know that you can go to Be Well and find the support that you need. Mm. And that's a fundamental shift in how we empower young people. So it's not only about educating about the fact that there may be predators and mm. you know that you need to keep your password secure. Yeah. It's that holistic approach to yeah. um, um, helping young people and by ensuring that they seek help early mm. from the right experts and support organizations and from one another mm. um, by putting the Be Well platform we're hoping to normalize and destigmatize early help seeking mm. okay. and that that's a change you mm. know so you don't have to feel as a teenager as teenagers often do they think this stuff is only happening to me I'm so isolated and alienated so what we're trying to do is increase their health literacy by getting them to engage in discussions about this so that if one young person is feeling a bit down, mm. another young person will say, hey, you know what, I was feeling like that the other day, you should go along to the Be Well mm. place, they really help me. Yeah. So I think that's, um, we were talking today in the session about how our thinking has evolved over the last 13 years and for me that's one of the big things mm. in understanding. We really do need to take a more holistic approach. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm interested to know how children relate to virtual and real worlds and whether they consider them as one world and they don't differentiate between them or do they live two different worlds? I think you've hit the point, you've hit the nail on the head. Originally when the internet started up we had this whole thing about the internet space being hyper real and everyone's anonymous talking to each other. Fundamentally what's happening nowadays is for young people who've grown up and they've, they've never known anything other than a world with the internet in it, to them there's no distinction because they go to school in the morning, they mm. come home, and they're talking to their friends on social networking sites or they're IMing them. Mm. Exactly the same as I did when I was a kid. I walked to school with my best friend, sat next to her all day, mm. came home, and I was on the phone, the landline. Mm. Drove my mother insane. <laughs> you know? So it hasn't really changed that much. It's just the mechanism of communication that has yeah. changed. Um, and also, it's instead of being one to one, it's now it can now can be one to many. So a whole gang of friends can talk. Mm. I think um, our fear of the negative downsides sometimes paralyzes us in terms of conceptualizing what it could be. Mm. And increasingly, um, education ministries are realizing hmm, we really need these young people to grow up and be proficient members of the knowledge economy. Mm -hmm. For them to do that, the skill set that they need, precisely the sort of skill set that they acquire on a social networking site. Um, when, when governments try to replicate social networking sites, which are essentially, one could say, an online collaborative environment, yeah. um, the, because they don't have the money and the um, you know, amazing designers and etc., mm -hmm. the things that they come up with often 
they attempt to replicate the mm. Facebooks, but it, it doesn't work really well. So what we're seeing increasingly is that uh, ministries of education are thinking, well, actually, maybe mm. our understanding tells us that informal educational environments are actually mm. where a lot of young people, especially those who may not be top of the class, really acquire knowledge at a, at a rapid rate. And they're thinking that perhaps they should harness these sorts of networks. So in answer to your question, I don't think that for many young people there's a, a, a very clear yeah. distinction, except perhaps when they're playing uh, online games. Mm. Um, I think they acquire the critical skills earlier to be able to determine what is real and what is not real. Mm. But as in any human behavior, you cannot account for those people that there will be a subset that maybe yeah. cannot differentiate mm. very easily. And that may be because of some uh, learning issues or mental health issues or mm. their cognitive processing, information processing. Mm. But I would say in general, mm. um, it's safe to say that people see the distinction. Mm. Plus, you know why? Because there are consequences. If you're mean to your friend online, you was going to suffer. Mm. You know what I mean? So the, the consequences of their behaviors are yeah. very real to them. So that makes it very real. Mm. For this, when you talk about the psychology of the child, how does cyberbullying impact his psychology? And is it an everlasting impact or is it just uh, time, I mean, for a short, short time and then he can get over uh, the, the, uh, the impact of cyberbullying? I know, these, these are kind of perennial questions. And mm. I think when we differentiate between bullying in the real world, cyberbullying mm. has kind of overshadowed real world bullying. Mm. And we have, and I don't know if it's a coping mechanism that we have that we think, oh my goodness, cyberbullying is somehow different and alien and it's anonymous and it's 24-7. Mm. You know, fair enough, but re the reality is that if you're bullied in the real world, mm. it's even if the bully isn't there with you, it's still going on in your head, mm -hmm. the humiliation. It's yeah. not as if real world bullying that happens between 1 and 2 p.m. at lunchtime and your money is stolen. Uh, you know, the effects stop. You're like, oh, it's my best chance. I'm not affected anymore. <laughs> you know? So I think we sometimes have disproportionate responses, or we don't think, we don't apply the same logic to real world as to mm. online. And that obfuscates, it makes the uh, issue more difficult to understand because mm. we go off on tangents. The reality is human behavior bullying behavior mm. is, is, is not a good thing. It requires us as a society to make sure that we have proper education in place mm. to teach young people about treat others with respect uh, uh, and also troubleshoot, also make sure that we equip them for when they do behave badly to one mm. another, because they are human, mm, of course. <laughs> that they know to, to apologize, to own up to it. Mm. I think that oftentimes we abdicate responsibility. That's the root of the issue, mm. and we need to focus on that rather than distracting about, oh, it's 24 7, it's anonymous, or, or. Mm. you know, so I'm not sure that that is helpful. Mm. Um, it distracts us from the real core issue, which is mm. how do you educate young people to behave in a civilized and yeah. you know, proper so, fashion. Something I would really want to know from you, how can we encourage children's curiosity while not endangering their security online? Can we do this? And if yes, how? I think we can do that. One of the fundamental uh, things is that for parents to recognize that children's activity, children grow, children grow up online, mm -hmm. um, are the, the political and economic context within which we operate is that we're sending kids to school to acquire the skill set that they need to become proficient members of the knowledge economy. Mm. That requires them to have access to the internet. Mm. And for parents, the dilemma is that they know their kids need to access the internet, mm. but maybe they don't really understand fully what's on there. The onus is upon a parent mm. to actually get on to the computer mm -hmm. and familiarize themselves with it, or go to the local education adult education learning resource mm -hmm. or go to their friend or sit down and ask their kid, you know, there is a responsibility in parents to acquire that knowledge mm. and to do that in the same way as when your teenager starts going to sleepovers or discos or whatever it is, mm. parents generally assume the role of like, I must drive them to this destination yeah. and get them back, you know, it's just part of parenting. Mm. Now, and I think 
the critical thing is also to have open lines of communication. If your child sees something negative online, mm. in my experience of researching with over you know thousands of young people over the course of the last six eight years, their biggest concern is that if they tell mom or dad that they saw something bad online, mm. mom and dad will freak out, go ballistic, and ban them from using the internet. Mm. So if you're a young person, you're not going to tell your mom or dad. Mm. So there's a fundamental um, educational role that we have to say to parents. Remain calm. You must make it so that your child understands that no matter what happens to them online and no matter what they do online, mm. they should feel that they can come and tell you and you'll respond in a calm, supportive manner. Mm. Now that might sound easy to say, yeah. but and that, that is a fundamental message and I think that if we could communicate that to parents, mm. um, that would be a, sing a really singularly important mm. message to get to them. Uh, in the session today, we discussed the concept of child-friendly zones. Uh, for some people who don't know what this concept stands for, can you just give us a brief on what it is and then what's your take on it? Are you with or against it? Um, that's, that's a really good question and I think uh, we had some discussion around filtering solutions. So a parent could decide to create a, a attempt to use a filtering solution to create a child-friendly zone, which is um, one of the products that was mentioned uh, basically contains a blacklist that's mm -hmm. a list of sites that the young person shouldn't be able to access. And you then can uh, tailor it so that the child can only have access for 30 minutes or maybe an hour. Mm -hmm. So you're excluding them from being able to access negative content and you're controlling their access. Mm -hmm. So that kind of can create a child-friendly zone. From an industry perspective, uh, um, industry, uh, 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 company can decide to create a section of its service or maybe devote its entire service to a particular age group and target them. In those instances, they may augment the safety features that they've implemented on the site and do things like, um, for example, one of the things we do on Bebo is that we have a platform, an open media platform, and we invite professional content providers to mm -hmm. upload their content. Mm -hmm. However, we make it clear to them that they have the facility to age target and also label their content. So in exactly the same way as you see in a cinema or a TV, mm -hmm. um, content that's age targeted and also you know, something that says you may see mild violence in this. Mm -hmm. So we feel that that's a way to um, uh, empower young people. Similarly, some companies decide, okay, we'll show certain content at certain times of the day, mm -hmm. and then after 11 p.m. there's more adult content, mm -hmm. or content that may not be appropriate for an 11-year-old. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there are a variety of techniques that can be used. Um, in, in addition, also some service providers decide, okay, we'll allow people to chat with young people in the same age group, we're mm -hmm. going to moderate that chat, but the chat can only take place at certain times of the day. Oh, okay. So that kind of day parting and allocating time and resources so that con you ensure the content is appropriate for young people. Mm -hmm. You can also go further and have an edit a full editorial control, so only content that has been pre-approved mm -hmm. appears on a site. Um, from a social networking perspective, there are a number of sites out there where um, one in the UK springs to mind this was where they uh, it, it would seem from their safety practices that they moderate the con the, the communications mm. and the other ones go still further where the young person can only choose from a certain pre uh, ordained set of uh, statements so that they can interact with one another mm. so you can take it from that level okay. uh, all the way up to a far more liberal approach mm. okay. Uh, social media are very full of false identities. So how do you think this in, can endanger children online? And if children take part in, in presenting false identities for themselves online, mm -hmm. what's your take on this? Well, this is, I'm glad you brought that point up. Um, in the first five or six years of... Um, you know, the whole thing of getting internet safety advice out there. So from 1996 um, up to 2001, we, and even beyond that, mm -hmm. our safety advice to young people was do not give out personal details online. So in other words, if you're not giving out your personal details, mm -hmm. my name is Rachel, I live in Sir, you have to be duplicitous to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So we ask children, be duplicitous, mm -hmm. but also be able to detect when somebody else who is also being duplicitous is really a bad person, mm -hmm. right? Cognitively, that's way too demanding for an adult, not to mention a child. Mm. So I think that originally our messaging was maybe uh, flawed.
mm. and that presented problems. In a, on a social networking site, typically young people are communicating. Again, we've had research, um, uh, independent research uh, proposal, um, research findings from different parts of the globe that suggest that young people communicate with the friends that they've spent the day in school with. Mm. That's who they're communicating with. Mm. So the idea that there's lots of anonymous communication happening is very much a web 1.0 kind of uh, thing. The majority of the time, these, the majority of young people are communicating with their friends. Mm. However, they do meet people that they don't know in the real world, especially if they're online gaming or their friend introduces them. So it is perfectly legit, you know, possible to create friendships online mm -hmm. and, uh, and for those to flourish. What we focus on is, is that sometimes there may be users with ill intent. Mm. And part of what we need to do is to educate young people about those sorts of issues. So your point specifically was, what about fake identities? Generally what we find, what the research findings show, is that people present themselves. Mm. Maybe more like, oh, I'm so cool because I'm going here, I've been partying, here's me yeah. having fun, here's me having more fun, <laughs> you know. So maybe it's not a fully accurate, but I mean, th you, then you come to a philosophical question, who is, who is me, who am I, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, so generally they're communicating with one another, and you can't really communicate with your friends unless, how are they going to know it's you? Yeah. You have to have that. Now what does happen on occasion is that to bully another person, the, a young person might Take, I might take a photo of you, mm -hmm. put it up on Facebook and pretend to be you. Mm. Um, so that creates a lot of anxieties. Um, uh, and one of the workarounds for that, for example, is to create a... Uh, you can report the abuse um, to the abuse management teams. And also, though, fundamentally, I think this is an issue that has to be... that needs a multiple response. Mm. It's not, if you focus simply on the, on the internet company, mm -hmm. um, if it's obvious that there's a breach of the terms of service, i.e. if that person is defaming, harassing, abusing, and it's clearly evident from that, so a, an, a, an, an observer can see that, mm -hmm. then we'll take action. But oftentimes, uh, you know, somebody may take over somebody else's page and then say something like, I know what you did last night, mm -hmm. which may mean that person had behaved really badly, mm -hmm. or it could mean that they behaved really well and won an award. Mm -hmm. If an abuse management team is looking at that, it's really, really difficult to make a decision because you don't know the contextual information. You don't know the context mm. within which I know what you did last night or, hey, I know what you did last night. We don't know what that is. Mm. So one of the fundamental issues is that we need to get um, um, anti-bullying experts and teachers and parents and young people to understand. I think for, for adults, there is a separation between the real world and the virtual world. Mm. So they think this scary thing has happened on this anonymous platform mm. and I must, um, you know, essentially we advise them, yes, report it to the service provider, but also this, is, this, this bullying has happened between this mm. child and her friends. Mm -hmm. So then you need to think about what are the ways you as a parent will help and support your child with that sort of an issue and whether or not you have recourse to the school to help you and support you in that. And many schools, particularly in the UK, for example, have an anti-bullying policy mm. that young people sign up to. So if you bully mm. and other people, either online or offline, you will be subject to penalties mm. w within the school, be mm. that detention or something else. So it needs a whole, what we need is a safety net to prevent harm to young mm. people. It isn't just one actor that is important, that is the sole has whole responsibility for addressing these issues. It has to be a community type approach. Mm -hmm. That includes industry, law enforcement, parents, teachers, the child, him or herself, and her peers. Mm. And also perhaps, uh, alluding to an earlier discussion, um, making sure that the support organizations, because not everybody has incredibly supportive parents or mm. they may be distracted, we need to make sure that that safety net also includes support mental health anti-bullying organizations who will deliver the support that this person needs when they need it. Mm. Okay, my final question for okay. you <laughs> would be that one of the statements that were said in the session that as a parent I would not lend or I would not leave my responsibility as a parent to a software that filters online content. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that statement? Are you with it or against it? And okay. also highlight on filtering softwares. 
I agree that I wouldn't agree. I wouldn't solely rely on a filtering solution to protect my child online. There needs to be open lines of communication. I mean, if you think of what was there before the internet and the concerns we had, people sometimes refer to TVs as the, you know, as a babysitter. You know, um, so I certainly wouldn't solely rely. I think filters are good for very young children because you don't want to. You, it, it makes sure that they're not shocked by mm. uh, content. As, but that must always be supplemented by having open lines of communication with your child and say, no matter what you see, no matter what you do, mm. you can come and tell me and I'll help you and I'll support you. And if there's a virus on your computer, I will help you. Mm. Um, and also perhaps explanations about, this is just my uh, personal view, we need to think as a society how we address the issue of what they might encounter and what's the best advice to give to a parent mm. and maybe parents there are a lot of um, networks of parents online who share with each other how they've dealt with situations so one child seeing an image of pornography because of the personality of the child a parent will respond in one way mm -hmm. and another child in the same family who sees it because of their personality and their circumstances their age their cognitive development will require maybe a different response the worst response is oh my god, mm. I'm going to ban the internet. Um, and then we need to rely on psychologists and support organizations to give us some insight, and also parents, to augment the literacy about how you address these sorts of uh, issues with young people. Mm. Thank you so much for this lovely interview and these, all these thoughtful insights. We appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my Thank pleasure. You so much.